Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar, Digital Assets in Asia, Corporate Treasury and Investment Trends. I'm your moderator, Rishi Ramchandani. I'm uh, leading the charge here with BlockFi's Asia expansion. And I want to start by thanking everyone in the audience for taking the time to listen in. We have a range of people dialing into this webinar from all over the world, ranging from high net worth individuals, institutional investors, family offices, and leaders in the financial industry. Uh, for the audience, I encourage you to please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar. There's a Zoom Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So we already have a handful of questions that have come in uh, by email over the last couple of days that I'll be throwing in there. And uh, yeah, we have, a, we have an amazing group of panelists here. We have uh, Mark Robinson, the COO of SBI Digital Asset Group, Digital Asset Holdings, Ran Yi, the COO of Wootrade and Kronos Research, and Ben Zhu, the co-founder and CEO of Bybit. Uh, we're all very excited to discuss the investment trends that everyone here is seeing at an institutional level, specifically in Asia, and dive into the corporate adoption of Bitcoin as a treasury reserve. So I'd love to start by giving everyone on the panel the opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience. It'd be great if we hear a little bit of background on yourself, how you got into crypto and in um, the current firm that you're at now. So maybe we could start with Ben. Hi everyone, this is Ben. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bybit. We are a crypto derivative exchange. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be on uh, today's panel. Uh, although the topic might be a little bit uh, uh, not in my familiar uh, space, but I can obviously comment from a industrial uh, person perspective. Uh, my background, I, I was doing a, I was running a crypto, not crypto, uh, Forex exchange for uh, about eight years before uh, starting up Bybit in uh, 2018. Um, and, you know, uh, got into the crypto space and really see the, the potential and the future of, of Bitcoin and the tech, technology. And that's why I decided to come in and uh, set up Bybit. So we are focused on the derivative track. Um, and, and yeah, so uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Cool, why don't we move on to Mark? Hey guys, nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Mark Robinson. I'm the CEO of Digital Asset Holdings, uh, part of the SBI group. Uh, we're really focused on the institutional market space globally, uh, looking to build a whole ecosystem around uh, the institutional marketplace, uh, particularly um, focusing on clients such as yourselves today. Uh, my background is I've been in uh, traditional financial services for over 20 years, um, starting off uh, back in the Lehman Brothers days and then building out uh, quantitative foreign brokerage um, for Nomura, moving over to JP Morgan as well, um, and then Getting into uh, getting in on the SBI side, focusing on the traditional exchange business, looking at the market microstructure, um, and then SBI started getting very heavily involved into uh, fintechs and uh, digital assets in general. And so I helped establish um, our retail uh, crypto exchange here in Japan. And then for the last two years, we've been uh, really expanding our business model out. So now we're responsible for all of the uh, digital asset initiatives for the SPI group globally. Very nice to meet you all. Great, and uh, lastly, Ran. Hi everyone, glad to be here. Uh, I'm Ran from Kronos Research and WooTrade. Uh, Kronos Research is a quantitative trading firm based out here in Asia. Um, we are primarily high frequency traders in the cryptocurrency space, though now we have a variety of um, lower frequency type of strategies. And about two years ago, uh, slightly less than two years ago, we created an institutional trading platform called WooTrade. Um, and uh, WooTrade has been in operations for a while now, and we have, um, we're trading spot and leverage spot, uh, aiming to deliver the deepest liquidity at the cheapest cost um, to, to institutional traders. Um, a bit of, uh, we have 80 people in total um, in Asia. And uh, a bit about me, I'm from traditional finance as well. Start off back right before the financial crisis 06 um, in uh, fixed income derivatives. So at the, at the, um, at the, at the epicenter of the, uh, of the, of the disaster. Um, and then moved on to uh, institutional asset management in the States and 
later on in China um, and uh, joined the crypto space at the height of uh, 2017. <laughs> and uh, again, experienced that, uh, that roller coaster. Um, but now, you know, we, we, have, um, we have a trading business and also um, an institutional trading platform. Glad to be here. Okay, great. Um, that's awesome. That's a really good uh, range that we have here. We have Mark representing a large corporate, Ran representing a um, large buy side firm, and Ben representing one of the largest futures platforms, uh, and myself, one of the largest uh, lenders in the digital asset space, but all of us with some traditional finance background there. So, so going off that, let's just drive straight into it. Um, for the first topic, I'd love to talk about what have been the key drivers of the increasing institutional attention that the digital asset industry has gotten? And we'd love to hear about what you're seeing globally and specifically what you're seeing over here in Asia. Um, maybe we could start with uh, Mark. Sure, no problem. Um, so I, I think to, to answer this question, I, I mean, you have to look back over the last few years and, and really what's been happening in this space. Um, I, I, I think now we're entering a period within this broader um, digital asset world where stability and um, confidence into the marketplace is uh, starting to gain momentum. Uh, e even just up to a few years ago, um, there was still a lot of um, discussions around the legitimacy um, of digital assets um, as, as, a, as a trading methodology um, and, and whether or not it was just a, a short-term trend or whether the, uh, this industry was actually here for the, for the long term. Um, and, and I think as now, now you see some of the larger players, some like PayPal, for example, has been very vocal about getting into this space. It, 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 adds, it adds that extra layer of legitimacy into this overall platform. Um, one of the reasons, for example, why SBI has been very aggressive in building out uh, digital asset holdings in Asia is because we're actually um, getting a lot of demand from institutional clients saying that they want to get more and more into this space. Um, they may not necessarily, necessarily say it as publicly. Um, however, what they do want to do is they want to deal with venues that have um, a, a strong reputation behind them not just necessarily in the digital asset space, but in the traditional asset type space as well, someone like SBI has. And so when they're trying to convince their internal risk management team and their compliance teams to suddenly start increasing the percentage of their total trading portfolio into digital assets, um, it, it's generally um, an easier conversation to have when they're saying that the counterparty would be someone like SBI, um, versus um, a, a shop that's not quite as established as us. Um, but I, I, I think we, we are still very much on that, on that cautious verve, verve. So one area that the industry still does need to be very careful on is the, the whole security element side of things. Um, I think if, if you get another big um, hack coming in into, into the press, and, and especially now with uh, digital custody playing more and more of a prominent role in this space, um, that can quickly change the, the comfort level that we're slowly seeing being adopted by institutional clients at the moment. So I definitely think we're heading in the right direction and we are seeing more and more momentum. Um, we, get, we get inquiries on a regular basis in Asia um, for what we're looking to build and, and provide to our clients, but it is still um, at that very delicate stage right now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, um, you're right, it is delicate because I think we're getting more, well, the thing is we're getting more sophisticated players um, coming into the space. And, and you know, what we've seen over here at BlockFi was a while ago, we saw a lot of the HFT players come in and, and Ryan, I'd love, I'd love to hear your, your view on that. Um, have you, have you seen a lot of your, I guess, ex-colleagues or your traditional finance competitors uh, start to come into the crypto space? I know you guys were early. Yes, certainly. Um, so one of our co-founders, Mark, he came from Citadel um, and having traded there for 10 plus years, um, I guess we, we're considered early, but then we've seen a lot of HFT players 
come in, whether they're crypto native, uh, you know, the like Alameda or the, the traditional guys. Um, I think guys like Tower and um, a bunch of the traditional HFTs are trading in crypto uh, in a proprietary way. Um, and I think it's very natural. We're, we're more, uh, we're more risk takers and it's in this prop and they'll come in and try to, uh, you know, generate fractions of basis points, uh, trading in the markets. So we see a lot of that. And, um, and obviously the, the past year and this year, we've seen a lot of changes in the microstructure of markets where you can see some of these more institutional guys come in. Um, and there, it's not just the HFTs, it's the, uh, you know, the CTAs or the, the, the larger traders, um, the, the arbitragers and, and such. Um, so we've seen, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, uh, high frequency traders in the market, um, currently, and it's, it's a much different, uh, environment than what we saw, uh, two, three years ago. Um, but obviously liquidity has improved quite a bit. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a better, it's a better trading experience for the average trader because there's so many people uh, making markets, uh, in crypto today. Okay, great. And, and, and Ben, I'd love to hear about on, on the future side, what are you seeing over there on the institutional? Has there been interest? Has it, has it, what, where, where has it really been coming from for the future side? Um, yeah, there has definitely been growing a lot of interest. I, I think, uh, the, the main driver is is obviously number one, uh, Bitcoin and digital assets getting more widely accepted. So is it, is, you know, like Mark said, it's easier to convince uh, the team to uh, try out this area at least. I remember um, uh, when we first launched not too long ago, uh, a lot of institutions contact us and they want us to do many things for them, uh, including they want to know who is their counterparty, who they're trading with because they need that, 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 that. But you know, six months, one year passed, and somehow they just all came, still came in. <laughs> uh, um, and obviously, I think when we talk to them all the time, and we get a lot of institutional requests. Um, uh, Rand work with us very closely. Kronos, you know, Wutra and all that. Um, so we work with pretty much all the major players uh, because we do have one of the best liquidity for Bitcoin uh, USD pairs. Um, so you, I guess the most uh, thing attracts them is that the liquidity is much better than a year, two years ago, uh, and also all the different tools are there. Uh, also, the option market is much more sophisticated, uh, much more sufficient, and also you have different tools, uh, bulk orders, and all these type of things. So um, you know it's 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 a different scene, and because it's getting more widely adopted, um, much larger size can be traded. Um, I was also talking to uh, Paradigm, one of the boat order guys, and they, you know, um, they do quite a bit of volume as well. Uh, and they were telling us how they work with exclusively with institutions and uh, a lot of these guys are coming in simply because they want to come in before. Um, but the tools, the, the weapons are not ready, but now it's, it's getting much better. So, uh, so uh, and also the wide adoption. And I think the whole COVID, it really sort of, uh, expedite the, the consensus on crypto and the general beliefs. I, I guess we will get into uh, later on on this, uh, on this, on this, today's topic. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think, I think one of the things you touched on was the, uh, the counterparty, right? I, 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 back a couple of years ago, everyone's asking about the counterparty risk. I think that's one of the biggest things, uh, within the digital asset space that a traditional finance, especially institution looks at. We definitely get that question a lot. Um, and there, and there's ways to address it and the ways to, establish yourself better. But I'd love to kind of go off that. And, and Mark, you talked a little bit about the risks, but maybe kind of dive into the risk from an institutional standpoint, but also what are they thinking about before they enter and some of the barriers that we will still see uh, this year and in and, and, and the next couple of years until, until the digital asset space can resolve them. Well, I, I mean, I'm a firm believer and in, in from our clients that we've been speaking to, um, in, in order to get this more broadly adopted within the institutional space, you need to make sure that you're offering it, offering it in a way that isn't too different from your traditional asset types. Um, so one thing that we've been very, trying very hard to do is to make sure that the onboarding process and procedures and even the protocols used to get connected are, are standard across the board and a, a very bread and butter to, to an IT guy that would actually need to be the guys actually 
getting connected in, into our ecosystem. So things like standard things like fixed connect connectivity, um, being able to provide standard market data out to the clients, things like that is um, it, it's all very simple things, but doing it in a way that means that the actual implementation effort needed from an institutional client is, is not so different from if you're connecting to some other third party in the, in the traditional asset class space. Um, I, I, I think when you look at all of the players that are out there right now and, and all of the different uh, opportunities that institutional clients can have access to, um, I, I, I don't think many of them are offering that type of connectivity um, in an in a, in a easy adoptable manner. And um, I, I, the thing is, all of us on the core have been in financial services world before. Um, you're still, you've still got to fight for those resources to get connected to something new. So even if you're the trader, even if you're wanting to connect and have access to these assets, you're still fighting for the same IT resources to actually get you connected in the first place or do any particular development changes on your systems that you need to do. Um, so so I, I think that's an area that um, we, we, we still, as, a, as, a, as an industry, um, are slowly getting there, but I, but I don't think we're there uh, quite yet. Got it. Yeah, I uh, agree with you over there. Um, let's, take a, let's take a pivot away from this about the risk side. Let's talk about corporate treasury. So with Tesla and MicroStrategies making the headlines um, on the new large purchases of Bitcoin, a question I have maybe for Ran is from the HFT side and, and others also, how has the corporate adoption of Bitcoin as a treasury reserve impacted any of the market dynamics? And how do you see it for, how do you foresee this happening in the future too? Uh, for, I've always thought that um, and within a few years, possibly as, um, as long as three years, there will be widespread institutional adoption in crypto as an asset class. And it's really come through in the past year um, back when we were managing assets for pensions and sovereign wealth funds, um, just in the traditional space, um, the, the consideration was simply, um, you know, what are the, what are the sharp ratios? Um, what is the, uh, the diversification to the existing portfolio? So it's not just about returns, it's about correlations. Um, and, and Bitcoin crypto, you know, has that, right. It's, it's, it has, a negative or zero correlation to traditional asset classes, even though it, it'll probably get more and more correlated um, as time goes on, because the, the the traders and the investors in the space become more and more similar, whereas before it's completely different people. Um, and, uh, you know, you were seeing that happening. And as infrastructure comes into, uh, you know, all fall into place with custodians, with um, traditional exchanges like the CME, with uh, you know regulations, um, it's 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 going to be and you know and guys like Great Scale with their index funds, um, it's going to be an institutional asset class. And I think I mean corporate treasuries buying Bitcoin um, is just a piece of that. And I think probably a small piece. Um, there, I think it's it's more it's better for the industry from a, from a marketing and branding angle, and then just general gives general credibility. But I don't think they'll they'll trade a lot, right? Given that they're public companies, they're just coming in and they're buying it, and they're probably going to hold going to hold for a while. I think the more interesting thing is when the you know the guys like uh, like Vanguard or um, you know or BlackRock when they come in and offer all types of products that are more. Um, frequent in trading to their investors, um, it'll really, I think it'll really change the, the industry. Yeah, okay, and then yeah, HFT is like, we're just there to make a spread, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Mark, Mark you, uh, you, you were not along there. You wanna add something over here? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything Rand's saying. Uh, I mean, I think right now uh, where we are on the treasury side of things, a lot of people are, are, are buying and holding in these large numbers. What we do need is, is some of these larger um, institutional firms that are a little bit more active on, on the bulk buying and selling side of things to really start um, getting, this, uh, getting this moving into, into what we all believe is going to be the direction that it's heading down. 
Um, we, we are already seeing some of that, uh, but I think we are really at the very beginning of, uh, of, of the institutional adoption of this. I, I do think we've got a long way to go. Um, we, we believe that um, it's gonna still take about another two to three years um, before you see full adoption from institutional clients. Um, but certainly um, this, this year alone um, has, has been a great kickstart for this. Um, and, and we believe that the rest of 2021 going into 2022, um, we, we're going to start seeing a more gradual increase. And then by around 2023, I think is when you're going to start seeing um, larger mainstream adoption of this from an institutional point of view, hopefully sooner, but uh, who knows? Yeah, I think, I think the way I kind of saw it was, you know, two years ago, if you told me one of the largest companies in the S&P 500 is going to hold a large Bitcoin reserve on their balance sheet, I would have I would have I would have bet against that. Um, I just wouldn't have believed it. And and now you have anyone who has S and P exposure suddenly has exposure to Bitcoin because um, when that price moves, then so do some of these companies like Square and so forth. Um, so so to me, it was just it was just, it came it came quicker than I thought. So all these predictions that uh, I love to put out there, I think are going to hit quicker, which I'm happy about. <laughs> um, but Ben would love to hear your thoughts on the uh, on the Treasury side. What, what are you thinking? Yeah, um, I think I speak through a, a general, uh, whoever, someone who believe in crypto and Bitcoin. Um, I, I think a company, institution or individual, we make decision based on same general rule. If you sit on a bunch of, you know, you're pretty healthy on your cash flow, you wonder like what you're gonna do and save the value of your, your money, right? And uh, last year alone, 30% uh, of the total US dollar ever created was created last year. So you sit on so much cash and you're like, well, we're losing money uh, <laughs> with that cash. So where can we store it? And I think it's only a rational decision to at least put a partial of it uh, to, to Bitcoin. So I think this whole thing shows the consensus is already forming and uh, it's definitely going to go even faster. And so I believe not only companies, Apple and all these companies are going to start reserving Bitcoin. I think even smaller countries, uh, because whatever they print, uh, nobody trusts it. And, and if everyone is starting to trust Bitcoin and this online form of uh, gold, um, I, I think this, again, like Mark said, it's, it's, it's just a starting. Um, for me, I think uh, Bitcoin eventually will get to, you know, the value of gold. So eight, 10 times, you know. Um, so that, that that's my point of view, and and it's already happening like very fast. So <laughs> I think it's happening a lot. Yeah, it's very rational from their side. Um, I mean, our company because we are a crypto company, we put a lot of our reserve on Bitcoin. So <laughs> so I guess for me, it's normal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more about the the you know you say we say smaller countries, but it's the countries which have the more volatile currencies, right? Um, exactly. Yeah. Argentina, the Nigeria, the 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 ones where the currency is just so volatile that it makes sense. Uh, us over here at BlockFi, we're seeing massive corporate adoption. Um, our wait list now on the corporate side is like two to three weeks, uh, just to get an account open, and we're seeing corporates come in. Like we see all the news about the public stuff, right? Um, but it's also all the private companies. We're seeing SMEs across churches, um, dentists, restaurants, uh, and everyone looking to buy Bitcoin and then hold it. And on our platform, you're earning yield, right? Um, and, and it's for a number of reasons. It's for defense against inflation, like you mentioned. It's the negative interest rates. Um, it's also FOMO. You know, they're, they're, they're seeing that these big public companies are going in and they're thinking, wait, I have it on my PA. My PA has gone up. Why isn't my company doing that? I have a bunch of restaurants. We should put some reserves in there. Um, so, so it's really interesting to see. And, and on that note, we actually have a good question from the audience um, that I'd like to kind of throw in here is, do you see it? Do you see Bitcoin the only coin to be adopted by these corporates for treasury management? Or do you start seeing them adopt other coins? Um, maybe Ren, uh, if you have any thoughts on this. Just based on more like what's kind of too big to fail, then ETH is obviously the, the, the next one, right? Um, there's more and more adoption. There's the index funds, the futures that came online. Um, so then it's kind of too big to fail. So I, I, you can see that. And then there's all this utility that comes with it, DeFi and such. I can also see um, stable coins, right? So it's probably, I think, can certainly put more stable coins and generate yield. So yeah, BlockFi 
were much higher than the uh, average corporate bank account, right? Or the average CD um, and even DeFi if they're adventurous. Um, so then I can see a lot of that um, happening so that it's not a volatile, volatile asset. Yeah. Uh, Mark, any thoughts over there about other coins being adopted by these corporates? Uh, yeah, I, I think it all comes down to risk exposure. Um, and and uh, we, we kind of already mentioned around around the liquidity side of things. I mean, I th I, I think if you're if you're looking at it from a from a treasury perspective, um, I I believe uh, my view is that Bitcoin and and Ethereum are probably going to be the standards. Mm. Um, I I think if you start then moving on around the trading side of things from an institutional perspective, then you can start adding a few a few extra coins to that list. Um, but but I, I, I think in terms of where do you want to put hundreds of millions of dollars, I mean, as an institutional client, you're more likely to go with what you would consider to be lower risk. And, and I think that that would be Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah, maybe it's you consider them large caps, right? Um, yeah. That's the way kind of some people would look at it. I, I've actually found it to be very interesting the same way on... Uh, an individual level, people kind of go down that rabbit hole once they get in and they start looking at, you know, within a few weeks uh, or days or months, they start looking at everything. Um, we have seen that actually happen with corporates also, which I found very interesting, where it's the same thing to go down the rabbit hole, not on a treasury management side, but we have seen them go down that rabbit hole where they start asking about all types of coins where you just wouldn't have expected them to. Um, and it becomes a fine line between, I would say, investing in treasury management and trading. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, ben, ben, any thoughts on that? Any thoughts on, on these, the corporates or, or I mean, institutions getting into any of these altcoins? And, and what um, I think any, to my personally uh, thought is any serious corporation will probably only take on Bitcoin because at the end of the day, I still believe Bitcoin is the only true decentralized crypto asset. Um, all the rest, um, you can dance around with it, but uh, there are ways to, you know, um, uh, affected and all that and it hasn't been proved as uh, Bitcoin has so I think the first adoption wave definitely would hit Bitcoin um, and then maybe gradually uh, as they the rest of them get more and more uh, decentralized or more people using it uh, but I, I think in terms of treasury strategy it's more of a defensive strategy it's, it's not really if you want to go FOMO and obviously you can go go crazy on an altcoin <laughs> uh, on a DeFi. But uh, I think as, as the treasury, most, most corporations look at it as more de defensive, you know, portfolio type of strategy. So uh, taking on crypto assets is already a pretty bold move. Um, I, I doubt that they're going to go on any altcoins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, this leads me, there's another, there's another question from the audience which I'm going to ask now because it, it's, it's somewhat related or, or, or a good angle to go from here. But it's... Um, they would love to hear about the, the the level of sophistication that these traditional players coming into the space, these global macro funds, uh, the level of sophistication they bring. Are the crypto native firms able to keep up with them? Uh, Ryan, if you have any thoughts over there. Um, I think the way we see it is there's certainly a lot more competition now, but then the market is growing faster than competition. So then we're, we're not so worried about competition at this point. Um, I think it's far from being you know, saturated. Everything is growing very fast, the level of volume, activity, um, uh, market cap. So, I mean, we welcome a lot more, I mean, we welcome the traditional participants into this market. There's probably going to be better dis price discovery, uh, less volatility, um, and it'll mature as in as an asset class. So, so then in a way we, we actually look forward um, to that. Um, that being said, there's also a lot of um, time and energy and there, there's a lot of uh, idiosyncratic risks with crypto as we on the, everyone on the panel all know. So then every exchange behaves kind of differently. The APIs are structured differently. Uh, in general, it's kind of not as mature as uh, say the traditional exchanges. The APIs aren't standardized, um, it trades 24 seven, and there's all types of risks that, that comes with crypto, right? And, and these are some of the things that a lot of guys are not, it takes time for them to, um, you know, just to even connect to all the exchanges in a proper way. 
um, without the standard fix API and um, and to and to you know just understand all the all the risks involved. So um, you know it takes time for them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we. I think one of the one of the biggest uh, things that I've seen for them to wrap their heads around is that twenty four seven Monday to Sunday. It's just that they're. It's just they're so used. We're they're also used to the Monday to Friday. You have your weekends off, and it's like, wait, I got to hire a twenty four seven desk because at, yeah. at times you have to have someone there. You cannot afford to not have someone on the desk, and even if you're trading CME, you got to have someone there for the other stuff. Um, for the spot leg or anything else. Um, so I found that to be very interesting with it, where their, their infrastructure just isn't built for a 24 seven desk um, yeah. and it's hard to wrap their heads around it. I just want to add one point is that it's, it's actually better for the industry because a lot of the asset managers who have come in or will come in, they'll bring their clients and the capital with them, right? It's easy for say Tiger or like, um, or Bridgewater to offer something to include Bitcoin uh, in, in their existing like pure alpha portfolio or, or to offer a new product, right? Like say BlackRock and then their clients are automatically inclined to, um, you know, to invest in this novel new um, capacity constrained product. Um, so then that brings a lot of capital into, um, into the entire market. So then it's, yeah. it's a good thing. Overall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a good thing. Uh, Mark, any thoughts here? Um, I, I think one of the, uh, I, I think is, is institutional clients um, get, get on board and, and obviously um, they're, they're professionals in, in the traditional space. I, I think one thing um, that the, the broader market needs to, uh, needs, to, needs to try and adopt is really being able to facilitate these clients on, on a multiple uh, fortitude of areas. So similar to if you're an institutional client and you'd want to, for example, let's say you're trading equity, um, you'd go to like say a, a Goldman or a JP um, for, for your all-in-one uh, solutions and they'd be your broker to, to deal with everything that you need. Um, that, that's something I think is, um, is still lacking in this market. Um, I think right now, traditional um, institutional clients they're looking to to kind of dip their feet in and offer subsets of the bigger the bigger ask, um, but but they're not comfortable yet to fully offer everything. Um, and I mean, this is one thing that we we're, we're doing under Digital Asset Holdings is uh, we we're looking to basically work with those type of brokers as well as the uh, the high net worths and and the hedge funds and HFT guys. Uh, where we can kind of be the all-in-one um, solution for clients to come into. Uh, so if they need to do any type of brokerage or custody, uh, we can facilitate that. If they need to get connectivity into the exchanges, we can uh, work with them on that so that we can kind of bridge that gap so that whilst they their end clients are asking for a lot of, uh, a lot of these type of uh, facilitation needs, um, they directly may not be able to offer it to their clients yet. And so we can work with those brokers and help facilitate their clients' needs on a much broader perspective. Um, and, and obviously, because we have the SBI name, uh, we, we have that level of, uh, of trust behind us as well um, that, they, that they can rely on. Um, but I, I, I think with the sophistication of institutions where they are right now will be very different in two to three years time. Um, the, the way we, the way I look at it is back, back in the early 2000s, simple things and, and kind of going to, to run on the HFT side, no one was real or th things like co-location and things like that were, were kind of just about being asked for, but slowly getting adopted. Now as an equity venue, you have to be able to offer co-location if you want to be able to provide um, a, a proper exchange in, in the equity market. I don't think we're there yet with, uh, with uh, crypto and digital assets in general, but I wouldn't be surprised if we will be there in a few years' time, whether, that, whether that's three or five years, but I, I definitely think we need to get to that or we will get to that point. Um, and, and uh, I think that's just a matter of time as you do get uh, a wider adoption of this from institutional clients, then you're going to start seeing the, 
more competitive landscape come in. You're going to see, yeah, Bitcoin being a little bit less volatile than what it is now. Um, uh, but then you're going to also have people start having a, a greater concern than they do now on things like latencies. Got it. And, 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 and Ben, how about you on the, on the sophistication, on these traditional finance guys as they come in, is there, is there things that they're certainly asking you about that will help, I guess, develop your company into a space that the crypto native firms are not really thinking about? Yeah, yeah, we've been asked many things. So to answer the question, I think who has got an edge? I think definitely crypto native guys have because we are a different game here. Uh, we get approached because we still label Bybit as a more crypto native you know, uh, derivatives focus on crypto uh, clients and all that. Um, whereas I guess uh, some other exchange like Mark, SBI, they're more in the middle, uh, but Bybit is over here. So I think if the traditional guys, if they want to come into the real battle world, uh, they need to adapt. And there are many things uh, they want us to adapt to them, but we will, we will simply not do because it will affect our <laughs> efficiencies. It will affect our policy procedures. And there are so many things on the crypto end that are um, happening extremely fast, um, such as DeFi. I mean, you're in the whole DeFi business and you know, uh, even someone in the industry don't understand what's going on in DeFi a lot of times. Um, so if you as a, you know, someone from outside a, a, a traditional world and you have the mentality of all these things ready and you want to implement that into uh, working to uh, crypto, I, I don't think it will work. Uh, but I, I think what will drive them is the is the retail interest. Um, you see the grey scale, and everyone is you know um, very interested in doing. And just like what Ren said, Black, BlackRock, whoever, if if they offer a crypto type of product, although it's a little bit in their portfolio, I think a lot of people will be interested to buy. Um, and just simply because that demand, um, they they are forced to really come into this world and exam, and they might have to get used to how we work here um you know everything fast paced <laughs> and the api and, and all of that so um yeah i, I think um to be honest when, when i started bybit i thought i would go towards the other other side i thought you know i'm gonna build bybit we're gonna build this whole fixed api we're gonna tailor solution to all the traditional <laughs> institutions but as we run we're like hey uh the real business the real people wants to trade is already there so we we just been forced to, to go that direction and we haven't we simply don't have the resources now to mm -hmm. be able to cover both spectrum and if, if i have to make a choice i need to first uh satisfy my crypto users and my crypto clients yeah so yep. that that's uh, at least for bybit yeah, <laughs> yeah that, 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 that's that's great that's great to hear your view i love the way you called it the battleground uh, <laughs> i agree with you over there I think I, I agree with you also in the sense that, you know, some when, when these large, large corporates are coming in, so we're seeing a lot of large corporates come in in, in, in the U.S. side, especially. They're looking at your, your Bitcoin Ether. And in the meanwhile, all the crypto natives are like, that's great. You guys take care of that. We're, we're going full DeFi. And for that, you need you need young, hungry people who are willing to stay up 24-7, kind of learn because it moves so quick that they just can't wrap their head around it. Um, and, you know, hopefully that adoption, well, that adoption will come and will come before we all think about it. But it's, it's very interesting to see the crypto natives just continue to keep running really quickly, far, far, further and further away because the industry is growing so quick. Um, so we'll move on. We'll move on to investors in Asia. And, and what, what, I, what I want to talk about is, you know, how, how would we describe the existing investor profile in Asia? Uh, how are they investing? What type of trades are they putting on? And I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and answer from a BlockFi view first um, to, to, to kind of give you guys an idea of what we're seeing. But so in the U.S., we're seeing, I think in 2018, we were seeing a lot of more crypto native. 2019, same thing. HFTs, all those guys started to come in. Your traditional finance HFT guys came in. End of 2019, start of 2020, we started seeing more of the traditional funds come in. Um, and the end of 2020 was basically when we saw all the global macro, the alternative asset funds, and all of them keep their interest. And in Asia specifically, I think that trend hasn't followed as strongly. There's a lot of inquiries, but the money hasn't followed as strongly. But what we are seeing over here in Asia are the more family offices, because I think they're able to move very quickly. There's a lot of family kind of generational wealth in Asia that we're seeing over here. And the types of trades that 
most of these guys start by putting on are the market neutral ones. So your fund arbitrage opportunities, your basis trading, the cash and carry stuff. Um, and we all see them kind of entry, enter into that way. So they pass through the legal and compliance and everything and get that in. And then they start taking the more speculative bets. Um, but yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. And so basically the types of, uh, types of investor profile you're seeing and the types of trades they're putting on. Um, maybe Rand, we can start with you. Uh, well, I mean, if you think about who has the largest amount of crypto, um, you know, a lot of it is, is exchanges, right? So then you can see, you see a lot of exchanges um, you, you hedging or putting on trades or investing um, a miners, right? So then a lot of the largest miners are out here in Asia uh, for ETH or Bitcoin. And they're, very, they're heavily involved, um, you know, in the space, whether they're you know, lending or, or investing or trading. Um, also very, very active in DeFi. Um, and then it's, I think it's more people like, like ourselves, like quant traders um, and, and, uh, and large traders. So then, you know, when we go to some of the sort of VIP events by exchanges, it's just sort of the same people that we, that we run into. And these are um, the higher volume traders or the guys who have a ton of crypto. Um, and I think an interesting thing that I'd point out is a lot of a lot of investors are Bitcoin maximalists or ETH maximalists. So then they don't care about Tether or USDC or dollars. They just want to maximize their Bitcoin. So I mean, the the thought process is like Bitcoin denominated or ETH denominated. Uh, there's no like dollar denominated, and um, and they could care less about the fluctuation of uh, of Bitcoin. Um, a lot of miners have that mentality, right? So then, um, you know, they're always they're always wanting like yield in in crypto terms instead of um, dollar terms. Got it. And 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 going off that, Ben, I don't know if you're able to say um, who who are the types of investor profiles that you see on your platform. Is it? I mean, obviously we have your whales and all, but on the I guess on the institutional side, what are the types of clients you see trading there? Um, most of the clients, um, I mean, first, I, I, I don't see a big difference in Asia or Europe because a lot of times even the firms are in Asia and you, uh, and they're actually not an Asian firm. They will be a European firm or whatever, or they register in some island. I mean, this is very extremely often in, in crypto. So you, you, you don't tell who, who they are from. And a lot of times what I find really funny is that uh, whether they claim themselves to be or they, some people make a referral, they always say they're this Russian big firm. And I'm just like, what's, what's up with all these Russia firms? And when you talk to them, they're not really Russian. <laughs> so, so I don't know why, what's going on. Why is a Russian always put this uh, mysterical name to it? And everyone just goes, whoa, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but to, to us, a lot of the uh, institutions we work with, they use a... Uh, they're either market maker or they, they're pretty much market neutral um, on Bybit. Uh, they're doing arbitrage, they're doing market makings uh, because also Bybit, I guess our fee structure, we offer a pretty good uh, mar uh, uh, maker fee. So, um, and a lot of these guys come here to, to, to help us with liquidity. Um, in terms of clients, uh, we see, uh, for example, Korean clients love to trade Ripple um, and they, they go crazy on Ripple. Um, and uh, we have a lot of Japanese clients demanding Cardano, these type of coins. So you definitely see a, a taste in different regions. Um, but other than that, I mean, we, we have all sorts of players in, in, on, on Bybit. And uh, um, yeah, I, I don't really see the difference, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, fair enough. Um, that, 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 that's fair and good to hear of you. Mark, Mark any thoughts on this, on the, on the investor profiles that we're seeing over here in Asia and the types of uh, trades that they would put on? Yeah, so, so I, I would say uh, we, we see going, going back for the last uh, year or two, more high net worth type uh, family offices as well, um, originally getting into this space. Um, we are now seeing a few prop desks getting involved. Obviously, you have the HFT guys as well. They've always been there. Um, in terms of what type of, uh, what type of trades, generally, um, more often than not, they're, they're doing some type of ARP strategy. 
Um, some of them are doing uh, even long only strategies right now and others are happy to just kind of uh, do a buy and hold uh, right now. Um, they, they're kind of, depending on, uh, depending on, their, on their risk tolerance, um, mm. will depend on uh, how aggressive they are on these strategies. But we are slowly seeing um, a, a broader adoption of different type of uh, algo related strategies in this marketplace. But um, I, I, I think once again, I, I don't think we're there yet in terms of, I think if we ask this question in a year's time, um, it will be very different to, to what we see today. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Let's, uh, let's have some kind of open-ended questions and this is where your personal views kind of come in. And it is, uh, let's start with, let's start with you, Ran, on what, what is your view on where we are currently in the market cycle, in the market cycle. Yeah, I think, I think the audience would love to hear everyone's view on this. In terms of price? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very, our holding periods are too short. So then I don't want to give uh, any price estimates. Uh, oh, no, you don't need to, like, where are we? Are we anticipating that it's still going to be a very much a bull market? You know, I, I personally think that we're still in the start of a bull market. I would say that we still got plenty of room to go. Um, um, I, I really, it's really difficult for us to say because um, our longest holding, our the holding period for our longest um, long long term strategy, like the, the CTA, the trend following, it's only the max is like two weeks. So then it's right. just too difficult for us to answer. Yeah, but then uh, like I'm personally a hodler, right? Uh, so then I, I'm I'm forever long uh, in in um in bitcoin I, I think if i were to be a personal view and not for the yeah company, please, please. Like, these are personal view this is learning from you guys yeah i feel like it's it's a bit later stage than uh than probably the the consensus because um it's there's a lot it's it, there's a lot of uh confidence and fomo um in DeFi in we see what we see in the primary markets and such. So then, uh, like I feel like it's later stage than uh, it kind of reminds me of 2017. Not not as, but um, I feel like it's a bit later stage than than consensus. Yeah. What, what, what about you, Ben? You're you're a somewhat a maximus too, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm holding Bitcoin. A uh, little bit Ethereum as well, but um, mostly Bitcoin. Uh, I'll pass on for generations. It's something I saw. <laughs> so uh, I think eventually we'll, we'll, we'll pass gold. <laughs> so I'm not too worried about uh, um, about about the current price and all that. Uh, but um, a lot of people has been asking me whether I think we are too high or too low. Uh, tends to be all the old OGs like Ran are a little bit uh, chicken about this whole bull run. They are a little bit saying, "Oh, it's lit run," you know. And uh, most times uh, they miss out of it. <laughs> this is the general consensus. But uh, I, I think I, I <laughs> at least on Bybit, everyone is crazy bullish <laughs> on our on our retails. So uh, I would still think maybe it's the middle middle stage. <laughs> but I, I I don't know. A market change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what 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 really I, I start to see is that you know when all these companies Tesla and you know uh, Square are uh, putting on Bitcoin as reserves, it sort of linked the price towards their stock as well. So yeah. it, it sort of uh, as more company adopt to it, I, I think it gives an even stronger foundation for Bitcoin. So uh, at least I think this bull run might be uh, more significant uh, than the previous ones. So that's that's my thought. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it also it also feels like, you know, it feels a little bit it's correlated in a way because of that. Right. Um, yeah. Because we start yeah. seeing all these companies come in. So it's more correlated than I think people realize. And, and it will only get more correlated, which is which is going to be quite interesting to see. But but Mark, your thoughts on uh, where we are in the market cycle right now. Well, I mean, you, you've had two conflicting answers right there. So uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean for, for me, I think where we are right now um, I think, to be honest, it could go either way. Um, I think if you start hearing more big firms um, publicly announcing what they're putting into Bitcoin, um, then I think you're going to continue to see a further dramatic increase in price. 
Um, I think if we don't hear anything for a while, then you'll you'll see the current price maybe hovering up and down, give or take. But I, I think you'll kind of see it where it is right now. Um, I'm not going to speculate on pricing, but um, I, I kind of agree that we're maybe towards the the mid stage of, of this price increase potentially. Um, but I, I mean, tomorrow, another big company and app, Apple could say, right, we, we're going to throw hundreds of millions of dollars into this. And then of course, you're going to see the price shoot up again. So it, it, right now, I, I mean, I think it's impossible to predict. Um, it, it really depends what comes out. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I think it's I, I think we're all in the same sense of that it's really it's, un, it's unpredictable. It's news driven right now, which is always scary. Um, and I agree a little bit with Rand that it does feel like 2017, but I also um, I'm with Ben in the sense that I never want to miss out. So, <laughs> um, all right, last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Is is look, we we've seen trends that have come around in the last couple of years or last year. Even one is Treasury management, the other one is DeFi, um, that have really kind of blown up in the space is there any trends that you kind of foresee in the next few years and maybe a trend that you would like to see and and why um ben you want to start um a trend i like to see okay um i i think um uh, although we are coming into a crypto that we all believe in decentralized and how it's not supposed to be one player driven or two player driven I start to see that the whole uh, ecosystem is becoming a little bit one or two, a few players driven. Um, although the, by the product or by the personal, I, I, I don't know how to say it, uh, the hero type of thing in the, in the industry. I, I think it's good, it's necessary to, uh, it takes that to, to really grow the industry. But eventually I would still like to see it become really sort of more decentralized in a way like that. And I know I'm kind of hypocr you know, hypocritical to say that because Bybit is completely centralized exchange. Uh, but we are also uh, moving to that direction. And hopefully by uh, later of the year, we will be, uh, uh, we want to also change some of the structure within the company to demonstrate that we are willing really to uh, embrace the idea of decentralized and all, all of that. So uh, we're, we're going to be announcing some big news uh, by later the year. But um, this is some sauce I've been, you know, thinking and hoping that uh, the industry are moving towards to. Yeah, that, that's that's great to hear. We need we need uh, we need visionaries to to move it forward in, into the right direction. Uh, how about you, Ren? Um, I'm really looking forward to like institutional adoption. So so then, um, just crypto becoming a, a mainstream master class. I mean, that's what I. I would really like to see happen, and I think it will happen. It just takes time, um, and I would like to see it being integrated with DeFi as well. Uh, I think that will be really interesting. Like for us, we're trying to integrate DeFi and CFI liquidity, where DeFi is really it's growing a lot, and we think it it's it's very you know from a from a yield perspective, from a trading perspective, you know once all these layer twos and infrastructure upgrades, um, it's it's very powerful and. It's just the beginning, right? So we really want to see more adoption uh, in that. And then, you know, the, the institutions are the ones with the, the large sums of capital that can really just springboard the entire industry and legitimize it. So, um, you know, I would really want to see, uh, you know, uh, those trends happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's me, me personally too. And I know BlockFi, we're definitely seeing that trend and we want to continue seeing it grow there too. Uh, Mark, take us home. So um, one area we've been spending a lot of uh, resources on is around the, the tokenization side of the industry. Um, I, I, I think right now what you're seeing in the token space is, is still very uh, early, early stages. Uh, we, we've identified a number of key areas leveraging tokenization where it has direct benefits for institutional clients. So stepping away from the traditional trading side of, uh, of what institutionals are doing, but how can you leverage tokenization for other purposes outside of pure trading? Uh, and that, that's an area that we've spent a lot of time and energy on and that we believe we've identified a few areas that 
Um, and we're already working with a couple of very large institutional clients on this, uh, where we can look to uh, leverage uh, this type of technology, uh, not just from a trading perspective, but for, for other uh, purposes as well. So I would like to see that adoption in the institutional side uh, continue to gain momentum. Um, we, we are literally at the very beginning stages of that. So over the next five years, I would certainly like to see that mature and uh, and continue to grow. Um, I, I, I think once again, fingers crossed, no major incidences, but I, I would like to see going forward that, as Ram was saying, the, the Bitcoin slash digital assets, take your pick on which ones they are, um, are, are just seen as another asset type and, uh, and, and can be more broadly adopted within the institutional community as well. Okay, great. Um, okay, cool. That puts us at our time. Um, this has been a great conversation with a lot of insights from industry leaders over here. Um, I want to thank our panel participants for their time and sharing their knowledge with us. Uh, I don't know, most importantly, I want to thank the audience for listening in. I hope you had a great time, learned something new from these guys. And uh, I think we're all on the same page when I say we're all looking forward to the continued growth as well as the adoption by institutions. So thank you very much and take care.